Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, the members of the audience that are seeing this. My name is Josiah Adema Dema. I'm a communications consultant. I do train uh, public speaking and debate. I also do train on governance and policy. And uh, today I have the honor to moderate this session that is talking about overcoming the challenges. And if you are in the know today that there are several challenges that we have, be it wealth or be it political, be it matters to do with governance. But then we have also people who are doing great things. And in, the, in their journeys, they have overcome certain challenges that we have in life. So today I'm joined by a lively, uh, great audience and great panelists of team of people who have, they have made things, they have started out things and they are, they're, they're spiraling out into certain levels that are beyond. But you see, for everything that has been made, there is a challenge. And then those are the challenges that we want to talk about, but also just not talk about them, but we also want to hear how they have been able to overcome and then looking into the future, especially right now during the COVID period, then what are some of the things that we need to overcome? So starting us off, we are going to have Najat uh, Abdul Rahim. She's with Niviche Foundation. And she is a global health specialist who has had opportunity to work with non-governmental organizations, both locally and abroad. She's a member of Nivisha, whereby they focus on mental health advocacy. Another panelist that we're going to have is Melissa Sassi. Melissa is the chief penguin of IBM Hyper Protect Accelerator. She has created her own penguin title and she has worked with early stage entrepreneurs on digital and business transformation. Then later on, finally, Jess. Jess, we do have Jess Pando, is the owner and craftsman of Idolina's Leather Company. As I will introduce the others as the conversation kicks off. Kindly, Melissa, I'll start with you. What does it take to start something? And what are the challenges that people have to overcome? So, you know, I think that the first thing that, you know, anyone needs to start something is uh, a problem or a market opportunity or a potential solution, you know, to those, to that market opportunity or um, to that, to that problem. And, you know, I think that things often happen when you are, you know, innovation often happens when you're trying to solve a problem for you, your family, or something that has impacted you. You know, I'm a big fan of um, thinking about, you know, what is, what is your founder story? You know, what is it that inspired you to go out and solve this problem? You know, what is it that, you know, inspired you to go out and create this opportunity? Um, for me, um, as a founder and as an entrepreneur, my life work, my life's work is really um, stemming from something, um, you know, deeply personal and also um, quite traumatic. Um, my uh, my children are victims of uh, my children and I actually are victims of parental kidnapping. Um, my children were uh, kidnapped by their father um, ten years ago. Uh, more than 10 years ago, actually. They're safe, they're healthy, we're in contact, we're very close, um, but I never got them back. And I realized that my lifeline to my children um, is internet access. It's digital skills, it's having access to a device, especially now during the COVID time where you know, travel is impossible. Yeah. And as I looked at my kids, I thought, wow, you know, if my lifeline to them is internet access. What does internet access mean to others? And so I set out on this mission to empower the world, not just my kids, but others with um, access to the internet, access to physical devices and the skills to make meaningful use of the internet. So for me, I'm a digital mother, mother. for others. It might be economic empowerment, access to healthcare or access to education. Okay, so the problem was there and you needed to create the solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. Just when you stepped out to begin your entrepreneurial venture and innovation venture, what mm -hmm. was 
what are you seeking out and how was the, was the it journey? It fell on my lap. It, it really fell on my lap. I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. I didn't even realize I was an entrepreneur in the very beginning. I just started doing something that I thought was the right thing to do until I realized that I had a company. And so that led me to create a company, which led me to realize that there was market opportunity and that I was onto something. And it also helped me to turn my personal tragedy um, into my superpower. And so for me, it helped to compartmentalize um, the challenges that I was having in life and not allow that to get the best of me and use that, um, that trauma, that grief, that frustration, that disappointment um, to turn that into something that could be bigger than myself and bigger than my, my personal circumstances. And then I realized I could make a career out of it. I know not everybody, you know, stumbles upon something like that. Um, for me, yeah. that was my journey. Um, there were many, many challenges along the okay. way and it was hard, but thankfully I've, I found a way to do it in my way that is authentic and, and meaningful for me and hopefully for others as well. And, and we're going to talk about those challenges because then people need to know that for you to get somewhere, there are challenges that you must face. Najat, well, how big the journey down. for you? And what, 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 was, what was your journey like, Najat? Well, for me, it's a little bit different because Nibisha started as a way to just collect clothes. We, a group of people came together and they were collecting clothes and taking it to areas where the, there was a fire outbreak just to help out. And while this was happening, we noticed that the, there was a need for um, psychological support for these people whose homes had burned down and had lost everything. But other than just getting clothes, they were left to start over without any soft skills to help them to adjust to their circumstances. So that's when we realized, okay, maybe we should start offering um, counseling services to these people who've gone through these traumatic experiences. And as we did that, we started looking at the youth in general and just our communities. And we realized that mental health was a big aspect of our community that was being overlooked. And unfortunately, within the African setting, mental health is a very taboo topic. So for us to start tackling this we start we needed to start having these conversations first of all so our goal initially was just to get the conversation out to get people to just start discussing our emotions and our feelings and our issues and the traumas we're dealing with and make it a normal thing before we can even start figuring out how to help or how to assist so that's how we started jess idolina's leather company what was the journey like and what got you to even go for it in the first place? Um, so really what got me going for it in the first place was I kind of fell flat on my face and my previous ventures. Um, so I've been obsessed with business from a really young age. I've always loved it since I was about 15. And so um, for the past couple of years, I've kind of taken gap years and gone and traveled a bit. I first went to Kenya in August of 2018. And that was when I figured out that I wanted to do business in East Africa. Um, and so whenever I, I started pursuing that, I was just kind of putting my feet in the water, kind of testing it out and ended up living overseas for a year and between Europe and Kenya and kind of came back here with the whole COVID crisis. I came back. I had no plans whatsoever. My schooling was completely canceled and I ended up working in a gasket factory just working, you know, 45 hours a week as much as I could saving up. And so finally, you know, I started figuring out what my next plans could be with school and all that and decided I need something that could travel with me that I could eventually go ahead and plant in Kenya. Um, and leather crafting was just a, a side hobby of mine that I started when I got back there in quarantine <laughs> and it came into a little company. So <laughs> So do, do you get your leather from the Kenyan market? I do not currently know. I get my leather from a consortium in Italy at the moment. Um, I would like to eventually, when planting over to Kenya, to yeah. get it all Kenyan sourced. <laughs> since since the, the idea was concretized, then concretized in Kenya, probably one of the, one of the appeals we'll make is that eventually you get to uh, import the leather from Kenya. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. the oh, bit yeah. of me as a patriotic Kenyan talking. Uh, get get your own business, man. You get them where it is cheapest. But bringing on the, the bringing somebody very articulate into this conversation, Sankara. If I don't take the shine out of you, 
Tell us the journey and how, what got you into that space. Thank you, Adiema, Adiema. I love your name. Um, first, you. to just, uh, first to just correct you, I am not the founder of Akili Dada, but okay. Akili Dada has been carried on the shoulders of amazing women ahead of myself. So I joined Akili Dada quite recently, uh, but my journey before Akili Dada, you have already alluded towards, I have worked with organizations that support women and girls primarily, but I don't come into that space blindly. My background is in IR, yes, and public policy, but I don't, I, the way I ended up there, I think is one of the reasons why perhaps I may have something to contribute to this panel of overcoming challenges. Because I, start, I started out as a university dropout, then I went back to school, I got pregnant, I became a single mom, I hustled, I was a hawker, I sell milk, I bred dogs. I've done so much to get to where I am today. So the one thing that I have learned and the one thing that I have appreciated about just having been young on my way towards the end of my life, I guess, uh, has been just resilience. You know, the effect that young people have on the continent is amazing. When you listen to a lot of the things that a lot of young people do on a daily basis across the continent, in county and out of country, is a lot. You, it's very easy for you to catch on a lot of intelligence that's just raw, pure intelligence that is looking for a sense of direction. And I think these forums should be, you know, a, a forum that allows for all of us to not only exchange and share, but to also be able to teach those who are listening in and those who are watching us today. And I hope that answers your question. I'm very, very passionate about young people and the hustle, very much so. He is a founder of Youth Safety Awareness Initiative. Pete Ouko founded Youth Safety Awareness Initiative, also dubbed Crime C. Paul. Pete, getting you into this space is a journey of something that took your spirit down. But what has it been? What got you to be the person who champions the youth to be the difference? Okay, thanks, Adia Madema, and thanks uh, to the panelists, uh, my fellow panelists, for uh, this moment. Thanks, Dr. Ashira. What got me to this moment? I mean, just listening to Sakara speaking before me has just, you know, it's just taken my breath away because she's speaking with this passion about exactly what I was saying, that the youth moment is now. Uh, I was wrongfully convicted. I was in prison for 18 years. Uh, and I think about in 2007, during my prayer fast, I got this vision like, hey, 75% of the guys behind bars are young people. Some are wrongfully convicted, some are rightfully convicted. But the thing is, they're wasting their youth behind bars. Uh, I was just thinking about the numbers behind bars being 75% and the numbers that were at risk of going into crime who are outside here and maybe we're still feeling that they're sheltered. So the thing was, how do we get this information out to them so that they don't waste their youth and they can turn around their lives? Whatever mistakes they've made in life, they will turn around their lives and make the best out of it. I believe in youth empowerment. I had young kids at that time. Uh, in 2007, my kids were 15 and 14, respectively. I'd left two young children out here. And I believe that by investing in other people's children, I was also investing in my children. And uh, and it just became of me that uh, we had to do that. So youth safety awareness, crime is poor means crime is not cool. And uh, youth safety awareness was born on death row of community prison in 2007. And uh, it's grown now to 13 years later to what it is right now. In fact, I'm speaking to you from Rongai. One of my most ardent supporters, uh, one of my most ardent supporters have been Dr. Washira. I mean, every time I go to DC, the whole team welcomes me like one of their own. And it's really shown me, I mean, I talk about the young people I meet in DC when I come back here because they love their cohesion, lack of tribalism, lack of animosity. They are focused on what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. So I believe that by borrowing what I've seen in the Dr. Washiras, in Aliz Wangu, and all these young friends of mine in DC, and letting get young guys know that, hey, you can do it. That's what has brought us to where we are now. And within that space, I can tell you, I've come to Rongai where I'm doing this from for one simple reason. A single lady, a, a widower, who has seen what the young people in Rongai are doing, has offered us space to put up a hatchery. She's offered us space also to put up a rehab center, all for free, based on what the young people have been doing. So our motto at Crime Sea is 
it's about you. It's not about me. It's not about Pete. It's not about us. And to the young people out there, don't look at yourself as, you know, this distant leader. When Sankara, when Dr. Washira, when all you young people are talking about leadership, it's about now. If things are messed up, I believe it's my duty, it behoves of me to bring the youth to this space where they can articulate their issues and feel that they are being heard and not only being seen. Many times we've told young people, you know, you stay there, your time will come. I mean, we started being told that when I was a young guy. Now I'm, 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 I won't tell you all there, but I'm very old now. <laughs> but the key thing is, if I've reached this space and the guys yes. coming behind me, my son is already a graduate, even though he doesn't have a job and he's positive about what he's doing. He's an engineer. And, and if he can't be in that space where he should lead, and I'm still holding on to the reins, when will they lead? When will you young people lead? And don't expect to be given that space. Come up, okay. you've already proved it. You go to all these corporates, they're being led by young people. But when we come to this space out here, the same discipline, the same articulation is not so pronounced. And so at Youth Safety, we are just telling young people, come and do it and do it now. We are ready to support you. Okay. And so then you get to hear the sense that there is something that has to be a problem somewhere so that you rise up. And when you rise up, you either rise up through starting something, innovating something, starting a company, owning an organization and everything else. And all these panelists that we have are people who have risen up to the occasion to do something changing the society. But yet, yet there's a belief that if it gets tough, then people step out of that space and just go and pursue something, hoping that there is a smooth ride somewhere. Melissa, what are the challenges that you have had to undergo for you to get to where you are now? You know, I, I think one of the, the challenges that I often see is that um, I'm the only woman in the room, you know, and I think that this is something that we often find in, uh, in technology and also the broader startup ecosystem. Um, last year, when I look at the applications for my, my startup program, I run a startup program at IBM. Uh, I focus on you know early stage uh, entrepreneurs, and I had between one and three percent of my applicants um, diverse. And when I say diverse, I mean women, black founders, Latinx community all together. I I wanted to cry because I am um, you know extremely passionate about building diverse and inclusive teams, and I failed. You know, and I went to my leadership and I said, you know, it, our applications are not coming in as, you know, diverse as I would, I would like them to. And I'm really worried that we're not going to have a diverse and inclusive cohort um, based on the interviews and the applications that have come in. And that's what happened. You know, if I pulled up a picture now of my first cohort, um, and I think David can, you know, probably, um, you know, testify to this is that it wasn't very diverse. It wasn't very inclusive on the gender side, uh, you know, the ethnic side. Country-wise, we were very diverse. We had eight different countries represented. We had, you know, a number of different industries represented. And so this year I made a lot of changes. I put investment, you know, more investment in. Um, I a significant amount more. I changed the way I did outreach. I did research on all of the different, you know, VCs and accelerators and incubators. Um, I put more of a personal touch to really thinking about, you know, diversity and inclusion. And I'm excited to say that we went from one to 3% diversity. And again, that's yeah. a big bucket of diversity um, into 50% um, of our applicants are now female founders. And 20% of those that have been shortlisted are are, um, black founders. 20% um, are from the Latinx community. And I'm just overjoyed um, to see that we will have a diverse and inclusive um, cohort that looks at, you know, country, it looks at, you know, ethnicity, um, it looks at gender. And I feel like this will enable not just IBM, not just me, but also our founders to bring more to the table and you know, I, as I looked around, I thought, this is not just a problem for me, this is not just an issue for me, but what can I do in my capacity to um, change this for others so that, you know, my founders don't look around the room and think, wow, I'm the only woman in the room, or wow, I'm the only black founder in the room. Um, but what can I do in, in being in a power position to help change that and empower others? Okay. 
Sankara, I'm bringing you to this conversation. Uh, Melissa says, I am the only woman in the room. And this is something that I know that you're passionate about in ensuring that yeah. even if it's just that one woman in the, in the room, then mm. she gets to have a voice, she gets to stake a claim and be there. But what is the challenges that you face in this journey? Yeah, thank you. I think, I, you know, to a very great extent, I agree with Melissa. A lot of the times you're either the only one in the room as a woman. Uh, in a majority of the rooms I've been in, I tend to be the youngest woman. You know, where you go into a room and a majority of those who are sitting in there, uh, seated from a position of influence and even experience, are way older. So that means that they're not even able to coherently articulate the issues for young women and for young people. And the one thing that uh, Akilidada even does specifically is to make sure that we are capacitating young girls, you know, young women, to not only lead, to not only, we say, exist in society and be meaningful, but to sit in these positions of leadership. And one of the challenges that we often find is that for a very long time, yeah, you know, women and girls have just been ostracized. You know, it's been systemic that women and girls are not going to be involved in various things, whether it's from gender roles, whether it's cultural, whether it's just the system in itself. And then obviously there's the one key one that is for a very long time, we were not investing in girls and women in schools with regards to education. So that's one of the things. And one of the pillars that we use at Akilidad is actually education. We do believe in education. You have to get an education. And this cuts across not only for women and girls, but also for young men and young boys. You have to seek and get an education. The only way out of poverty, the way out of decolonization, the way out of a mindset that is a defeated mindset is education. And education comes from different spaces, it comes from different places. It does not necessarily come from, say, a university or even come from a classroom. It's the experiential, say, it's the cumulative experiences that you're getting, how you're leveraging that and how you're anchoring that. The one thing yeah. that has certainly the, the one thing that has certainly allowed for, say, the acceleration of the lack of and the miseducation and the misinformation has definitely been the concept or even the issue that surrounds people operating in silos. So that even when we have women who are in leadership, these women are not are bringing younger women. When we have a younger women in leadership, the peer system is not able to support the learnings or even say um, be able to retain the knowledge or retain the ideas or retain the innovation or the creativeness that is within that space. And I love what and Melissa said. Why is it so? Why is it so? So one of the reasons is because the truth is it's not easy. You know, it's a tough space. So half the time we are all trying to just make it. You're all trying to just get there. But then it's because of organizations like Akili Dada, it is because of forums like these, it is because of what Dr. Washira and Dr. Elizabeth are doing and what you are also doing in your own capacity, that we are going to be able to demystify and deconstruct these old myths that we've had going on for a very long time. And, you know, we, we, we all, I, I like to say, we all subconsciously fuel the bias. You know, we all subconsciously fuel it, whether it's even, for example, you're putting out a job and you see young people applying for it and you're like, oh, no, well, that one is too young. I don't think that one is going to fit. A good example is recently, Akilidada, as recent as last week, we put out a job. And what we found on the job, a majority of the CVs I'm reading is that very few people are young. A lot of people are older. So then you wonder, if I am to work with young people, is it that young people don't have access to opportunities? And is the access with regards to they have no information, they don't know where to find the opportunities, or they're just not you know, ready or they're scared to step up? I don't believe that they're scared to step up. What I think is that they have been speaking for a very long time. They are so used to not being heard. They are so used to not being listened to. So they are now beginning to make that a new normal, and it shouldn't. As the young people of Africa, we must speak up. We must represent ourselves because we know how it feels. We, if you think about it, we are the generation that is slowly beginning to shake off the vestiges of colonialism within Africa. But then we have the movement that is Black Lives Matter on the other end. How yeah. does that impact us in Africa? 
How does that impact young people in Africa? When you start to think of the governance issue that is corruption, for example, who's going to be the person that suffers that? Which demographic is it going to be? The average age of Kenyans is 18. So we are teenagers. At 18, if you remember your own personal journey, you are beginning to decide where it is that you want to go. If it was yeah. not already decided for you by your guardians or your parents or by your society. Yes. So then basically it means that those who've gone ahead of us are always going to be shaping our experiences of what we are getting into. We, okay. a, a majority of us never really did even get to decide what trajectory you were picking up until something happened, whether you got a job, whether you lost a job, or whether you have an uncle who knows someone who knows someone somewhere. We are okay. the people to do that for Africa. We are the people okay. to do that for young women and for even young girls. So we are the people. And I'm, I'm so ready for the assignment. I've been on it for a while, and I promise you it's rewarding. Naja, this, this, this struggle for spaces and fighting hard to make it make sense sometimes can lead people into a scenario whereby their mental capacity gets to be drained. In your journey with Nivishi Foundation, how does this work out and what are some of the challenges, especially when you're dealing with matters mental health? Wow, okay. In terms of challenges, especially with Nivisha Foundation, for me and Amisa being young girls in our 20s, trying to get people to change how they view mental health has been very difficult because, first of all, in a lot of spaces when we step in, we're already disregarded because we're young. Then on top of that, we're disregarded because we're ladies. Then another factor, we're disregarded because we're Muslim ladies. Then we've had instances where we're sitting in a in a seminar for example and we have to give a talk on mental health and awareness and advocacy and you have a bunch of older men older muslim men and to them already from a cultural standpoint it's what are you telling me what do you mean as a muslim girl you should be at home why are you standing in front of me talking to us so we've been disregarded in certain settings like that and you walk away feeling very dejected and demotivated because you're like okay what was the point of me trying to do this if nobody's willing and yet, to listen to you've me? never given up no we haven't because at the end of the day change needs to start from somewhere and what somebody needs to start to get the ball rolling and for us we've taken that initiative upon ourselves to be like it doesn't matter what space we're in if we're given an opportunity to speak or to voice out our opinions we will do that irrespective of people hear us or not at least we are giving ourselves that platform to speak up and with that it's sort of started working out for us because more and more places we're getting invited to actually talk and partner with people and it's it's as a result of us either speaking at an engagement or being seen somewhere or vocalizing ourselves in either radio stations. So I think the only way we've been able to just keep pushing is that irrespective of the reception we receive, if you invite us, we're there. If you're not inviting us, we'll push the doors and be there either way and try and represent what we have to say. So that's the main thing we've been trying to do. And yet somebody has to do something regardless of the fact that you've been incarcerated for about 18 years for wrongful conviction. Yet when you, when you get out of that, you, you wake up and you rise up and you say that, you know what, I must begin a movement and a conversation with the youth on how crime is not a good thing. Pete, how has been your challenges on your side, talking to these people and also just getting the system to be something that supports your cause? I think one of my one of the biggest things I've realized is that uh, just like just like Nerget has shared, many people fear walking through that door. And coming out to work with young people, I love working with young people any day because I know the kind of energy they have, the kind of energy and, the, and purpose that they have and the drive. So to me, the key thing is we've gone so fast within a short time. Uh, just looking at the girl child as being left behind to sing, to come into a space where the girl child is actually in the driving seat. In my organization, I'll tell you, for example, um, we are only two guys, I think. Uh, the, the rest are ladies. Uh, right now, I'm struggling with a, a, core, a colleague at work whose discipline levels are wanting. And yet, ladies who've come to volunteer with us, we're not even full-time employees, are doing an awesome job. A young girl who's only 23, who left university last year, 24, sorry, left university last year, she volunteered with us. They started an, uh, a CBO in Dandora. Now she's grown that to three satellite 
spaces. Within three months during this COVID season, because we were doing the COVID awareness, we were doing uh, creme awareness, we are doing teen pregnancies and all that stuff. So what, what motivates me is the fire I see in the belly of the young people. One thing I try to miss, yeah, one thing I try to tell people is don't judge young people. Don't see these young people in hoods and say they're criminals just because of their circumstances. We break that barrier by having community dialogues with the law enforcement agencies in all these hoods where we are working right now. As you're speaking, this week we were in Nakuru. We've gone all the way to Nakuru to the west, moving down to the other side. And all these initiatives are being run by young, young, young people. What, what, what the challenges I've seen as we, we, we move along is fear of young people to make decisions. Just like Sankara said, they've gone through so much that it's become a norm not to try. But just like, I mean, I'm hearing my colleagues saying here, we've told them that it's their time to speak up, it's their time to step up. And the ones who are stepping up, in Rongai, where I am right now, we had 35 initial volunteers who've now grown to about 100 plus, 105. The 35 were all taken up by a government initiative, having seen how they were um, volunteering for two months during the COVID period, doing all the awareness, distributing sanitizers. The guy who supports crime si poor locally the most, apart from Dr. Washira, I'm sorry to mention him here, but <laughs> the guy who supports crime si poor locally the most is actually 36 years. He runs one of the biggest local uh, organizations, the slabs called Shovko. Kennedy Odede is an alumni of many, many organizations. And he's just shown resilience, he's, sh he's shown purpose, and he has a heart for his fellow youth, having grown up in the slums to where he is right now. And so the key thing right now, as we are building this movement of young people, we are telling them to take the opportunities. Be it a Kilidada, wherever it is, the opportunities are there. We are asking the young people, don't fear. Come up, there are people willing to hold your hand and walk with you. Mistakes could be made along the way, but there are mentors who are willing to walk the journey with you. So I, I just keep uh, focusing on the young people, like, where are their strengths? I don't focus on their weaknesses. I let them talk about their weaknesses. But also the biggest challenge we've had, of course, you'll talk about, many people will tell you, NGOs, financing is a major issue. How do you overcome that? We build local ownership, local solutions to local problems and local ownerships around the issues. And so it becomes cost efficacious to run an organization when the solutions are being sourced locally. The problem in Rongai, for example, is not the same as the problem in another part of Nairobi. Just like the problem in DC is not the same as the problem in, uh, in New York. So exactly. when people focus on local ownership, you build local ownership. Don't fear, they won't take over. And if they take over, the better. The key thing is working in silos and having that protectionist policy has made many organizations very ineffectual in this country. Because they're always looking over their shoulder like, hey, this organization, it will do what I'm doing. It will be the darling of all the donors. It's not about the donors. It's about the people you're serving. And that's what we keep telling the young people. Build your capacity. Build your availability. Build whatever it is in you, the what's in it in you. And then okay. grow from there. Steps in Idolina's leather company. Very tender age, first year. Say youth in the core. I know there must be challenges as a youth to start a business. There must be challenges for you to get that idea up and running so that then it doesn't stay defunct, something that you're brooding on. But are there systems that supports that? And so what are the challenges in Olsam that you've had to face as a owner and a craftsman at your company? Jace. I'd say the biggest challenge is just starting from scratch on it. Um, like I said, I started I started leather crafting back in, I believe, May, whenever I came back to the U.S. from overseas. And I had, you know, no blueprint for it. I just kind of, whenever I was in Kenya, actually, I spent a lot of time talking with youth there. And their biggest desire to learn about business was within e-commerce. And I had zero experience with that. And so really, as much as I love leather craft um, and really like these products and stuff that I'm making, it's come down to, I have to, as uh, Sankara was talking about, kind of find that education where maybe I can't find it in the classroom. So this is a blueprint of starting completely from scratch of figuring out or learning about e-commerce when I've had no prior experience in it, learning about obsessing over quality and handmade products when I have almost no prior experience in that. Um, and I wanted to make this, right now it's 
started as something small out of my bedroom. And I wanted to make it to, my goal was to transfer it over to Kenya with, at the end of my three years of university. Um, but just having the opportunity to be here today, you know, that's a, it's, we're way ahead of there already. And so, you know, I met kids, um, young men and women. I, I lived in Laki Sama and my home church is in Dandora phase four. So um, I met a lot of really, a bunch of young men and women who okay. were way smarter than I could ever hope to be. And, and Kamiti as well. I went to Kamiti in the prison in Nakuru as well. And so many young men and women there who way smarter than I'll ever be. And they were asking me questions about e-commerce and what they could do to get into business. Um, and I didn't have a blueprint for them. And so that was what this hope for this to be was. And it's a challenge getting it all together because I don't have a blueprint to work off. Um, but I think that I wanted it to be something to show those kids the challenges they're facing, um, not seeing that opportunity, not having the opportunity that I've had just by being born into the family I have. Uh, I think that, that's been the biggest challenge is just getting it there. Okay. Steps in COVID-19, aka Corona, and then this is our new normal. A lot of challenges are coming through. In Kenya, for example, kids have not been in school for the last uh, few months, as early as from March up to now. Uh, today, they've just made an announcement that probably they'll be back in school soon. Uh, there, there are uncertainties, the health sector, the businesses are lost and things like that. But yet, one of the things that we are talking about in this day and age is the technological advancement. Melissa, how does technology step in to bridge the space that we are in right now? So I think um, technology is um, the new, I think uh, I should say digital literacy is the new literacy. And I look at um, one of the challenges that we have in this world and that is we measure literacy, right? We report out in it, we know what it means. The World Bank puts out reports, countries put out reports. We look at it at an individual level. The UN has reports on what it means to be literate. But if you look across schools, you look across the government, you look across even the UN, there is no standard definition for what it means to be digitally literate. So if digital literacy is the new literacy, we should have a standard framework of what it means. And right now we don't. Um, one of the things that I've been lobbying for is that I, um, I believe we need to have a standard framework. Um, so I've been working with the IEEE, um, which is the largest engineering organization on the planet, 400,000 members worldwide, um, to create a standard. Um, I hear it's going in front of the standards board for a decision um, next month, which is something I've been working on for the last uh, two months with, or two years with a, a number of organizations like the World Economic Forum, the OECD, um, the DQ Institute, as well as the IEEE, obviously, on uh, endorsing the standard because if you think about it, you know, as we go out and we empower people to learn technology, whether that's um, emotional intelligence online, you know, it's not just learning how to code. It's not just, you know, thinking that everybody's going to be an engineer. Not everybody's going to be an engineer. Yeah. Not everybody's going to be a data scientist. But yeah. everyone needs to know how to keep themselves safe online, to protect themselves from cyberbullying, to um, protect their passwords, to understand how to manage themselves online, whether that's screen time or um, just their behavior, and understand how to recognize the behaviors of others and, again, keep themselves safe. You know, think about how many young people have access to mobile devices and social media and the challenges and the opportunities that that could provide. I believe one of the keys to life is um, empowering people to make meaningful use of the internet. And that, you know, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. What it might mean for a teacher is very different than what it might mean for a rural farmer in uh, in Kenya. You know, I look at, you know, IoT for agriculture, for example, how can, you know, a farmer, you know, increase his or her you know, yields, decrease his or her costs by using technology. Again, it's not just how does everybody learn to code, but how can you incorporate technology into your life to gain access to e-government services, to um, healthcare, especially during a time of COVID-19? You know, how do you protect yourself from media misinformation and disinformation? Um, and how, yes. especially during COVID-19, do young people gain access to um, education? And this is something that is, 
uh, impacting us. It's impacting, uh, you know, us as workers, you know, when it comes to being able to work in a remote fashion. And it's also about, you know, how can young people gain access to education? My kids have been out of school uh, since um, the beginning of the year and have not had any access to education except for what I've been sending them. Now they're, you know, addicted to TikTok and they're addicted to, uh, to Fortnite. Um, you know, and I can't say those are the most educational platforms on the planet, but um, at least they have access. And one of the yeah. biggest challenges though is, you know, forget about skills for a second. 50% of the world lacks access to the internet. So how are we, you know, building networks, building energy access so that, you know, people can not only make meaningful use of the internet, but hey, how can we get them access to affordable internet? Okay. Pete, crimes rate has gone high. Gender-based violence has gone high. Jobs and income generation has gone low. In your space of job during this entire period of time, especially the corona times, where is that space for the youth to take charge and be counted? with these challenges? I know and I accept that people have lost jobs. I know also that uh, there are lots of challenges across. But one thing I've seen with the youth is innovation. People are willing to get dirty to make a living. Honest living. I'll tell you from the crime statistics, uh, even in Kenya, you'll hear of the bigger crimes right now than the opportunistic crimes that you used to have. Our biggest fear initially was like, during this COVID period, you'd find more uh, house break-ins, you'd find more, um, what is it called, uh, robberies. But incidentally, that's not the case. There are crimes, I agree. Crime rates are going up, but which kind of crime? Gender-based violence is up. Sexual predators are out on the prowl. Child pornography and trafficking uh, of child uh, pornography is on the up-up. Why? Because most youth have been locked up and they were idle, and they have no role models. Don't forget, most parents, this is the time they're spending the most time ever with their children. No parent in Kenya, majority of parents, once the kid reaches three, three months, I mean three years, and they start going to kindergarten, hardly do they spend five months together with their kids. But this is the first time that that's happening. We are fighting, and I've had cases where we've had to come in when girls have been sexually molested, been sexually molested at gunpoint. Some of these cases are traumatic. But we are reaching out to the the real people who are perpetrating these things, who are facilitating these things. We've realized that in as much as we have perpetrators who are older than the victims, we are also having classmates who are also perpetrators. And so law enforcement is faced with a challenge where the, 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 baby, the, the, baby, the baby's dad is 14 years and the mom is 13 years, or the baby's dad is 15 and the mom is 13. And we are having, last week, we were just dealing with a child who was impregnated at the age of 10. I mean, I'd never gone through such stuff, and I think I'll leave counseling post-COVID. But it's heartbreaking that these things are happening, but we have to face them. We have to confront them head on. What we are doing right now is to let them know that these are opportunities even in such spaces. Those who are willing to move ahead, like right now I'm telling you, the lady who's offered a space here to set up a hatchery, the hatchery product is not going to cost so much. I mean... Compared to the investment, the returns on investment, it can employ 50, 30 youth. And these youth yeah. have come together and said, we are willing to do this. We are going to raise chicken, we are going to sell yeah. the chicken, we are going to raise the broilers, and we are going to do the hatchery, sell the day old chicks. And these are people who selflessly, they're in the room next to me here, they've selflessly decided they're going to do something with their lives. What we are encouraging the young people is take advantage of the small opportunity. You go to Dandora, where I know Jess knows very well, Dandora face two and uh, near, near the garbage site. Young people have transformed their spaces and now they're growing vegetables, their kitchen gardens. We just found guys who said, okay, fine, if they're doing that, we are going to get them uh, the soil for planting the vegetables for free. There are people willing to hold the young people's hands even during these tough times. We're just okay. calling them to step up and say where they are. At Crime Sipo, we are telling them, let us know what you want to do. We, okay. The other thing we do is to, to, to help the young people get the linkages. We might not have all the solutions, but we are getting linkages even locally within their own communities. And we get the linkages and we encourage them to take them up. So right now, my biggest challenge that I tell the young people is 
True, we have challenges, but true, we also have options. It might not be as lucrative, but you can build upon it. Those who are in IT right now, what are they doing with their time? They can use it productively or not productively. So it's just about mindset change. Let's accept that things are not the way they used to be. They might not be the same way they used to be. Level of income even for our families might be downsized. Our families might have to move houses. But let's accept that as a new normal and then work up from there. Okay. Najat, is the young Muslim girl ready? But even beyond the young Muslim girl, are the young girls ready to step up and take the challenge? And in this period of times, do they have space that they can fight for and be counted as part of the solution? And what are some of those solutions in offer? No, for sure. I think the young girl is definitely ready to take up the challenge. We have several organizations that have come up based like in the slums, either in Kuru Salams or Kibra, headed by young women who are actually assisting within this whole COVID experience. Like, for example, Nivisha Foundation partnered with an organization by a young girl called Aisha She's from Kibra and she started a Kibra for Kibra initiative when COVID started and there was the whole lockdown where a lot of the daily laborers come from Kibra who go into like the more affluent areas to work as domestic workers or hawkers or drivers or cleaners. And unfortunately, because of the lockdown, they weren't able to do so. So yeah. she started a whole crowdfunding movement and we raised over 3.5 million shillings and we were able to Yes, yeah. then we were able to feed over, I think, 3,000 families during that whole lockdown period with Kibra. And through her resources and with maybe Shane and other stakeholders, we made, um, I think we were doing food distributions every Saturday for a period of almost three months. And that was able to impact a lot of families within Kibra and keep them afloat. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to do so. So that's just one example of a young woman st stepping up to the challenge and assisting the community because okay. there's a need for it. Um, Nivisha Foundation has also just recently partnered with Kesha Alliance, which is also by a young lady. And the whole premise of our partnership is to strengthen community resilience against violence extremism amidst this whole COVID period and we're doing a whole set um, a set of six months um, videos just to educate the youth and to sort of like take away the stigma that um, around it, COVID and also mental health and to give them soft skills that can enable them to weather this challenge in this period. So when it comes to asking if young women are ready and young Muslim women are ready for sure they're ready they're already on the ground doing things and helping make a difference. Um, and in terms of how technology has impacted this period for Nivisha Foundation and what we do, um, we had to turn, because our safe spaces were physical spaces. We'd have seminars and functions where we'd bring the young people together and bring resources for them to use and bring specialists for them to talk to. So unfortunately, because of the whole COVID, we couldn't do that anymore. So we turned to the internet, we turned to YouTube. We started a YouTube channel where we film weekly tips by counselors and psychologists for people on how to stay mentally healthy during this whole COVID period. We started a session called Nivisha Chat Corner where we bring a bunch of youth together to tackle different issues and just share different opinions so that the guys who are at home who unfortunately now aren't don't have access to school and those safe heavens have somewhere else where they can get access to information and a release and also just the, the comforting feeling of knowing we're not alone in this that other people are going through it too and they're seeing what is happening we also started a helpline center where we bought a number and then people can call in if they need free counseling sessions no matter what time is it is we always have a counselor who's ready to answer a call and to talk to you and if you can't afford to even call in we call you so just send us a message mm -hmm. and we'll call you and you can speak to someone the moment you need to so yeah Sankara when it comes to policy development and uh, implementation do we have policies that support remedies or do we have stop gap measures that are just slightly not long-term oriented? And how do we ensure that whatever we yearn for, we get them in policy documentation? Yeah, well, 
that's a very good question. Uh, a quick off the cuff answer is no, we don't have good policies. We don't have enough policies. We have a lot of policies in Kenya. As you already know, Kenya is one of those countries that is really, really huge on policy. So we have a lot of policies on paper, but when it comes to implementation, that's another question. Um, the constitution of 2010 did uh, bring on board the public participation. Uh, and the aspect of public participation is, for, is to allow not only young people, but everyone as a Kenyan, um, to be able to participate in the democratic space of what is it that you require within this county? How do you want resources to be allocated? You've seen the drama that has arisen with the revenue sharing formula in Kenya in itself. The youth is not being mentioned anywhere. That's not like that, that those, two, those two thematic areas are so far from each other. So we do not have enough policies and we do not have adequate even policies. And one of the reasons is because one, I believe that it is not inclusive. The youth are not included. And when the youth are required to be included, information is not disseminated, whether it's on time, whether it's in spaces where they are going to meet the youth. I love what Melissa, Melissa was talking about, the digital literacy. If that's the next literacy, are we ready? You know, if you think about Kenya, how many of us have access to smartphones or to smart gadgets? How many of us? Because right now during COVID-19, it's been proven that even parents who used to say that I don't think I would buy my child a phone or I don't think I would buy my child a laptop or even a tablet are now thinking about it because it is seemingly becoming more of a necessity. So then the quick question and the bigger question in this is how can we best design policies that are able to incorporate young people? And it is simple for the youth, for the young people, by the young people. Melissa, you wanted to chip on uh, something very shortly because I saw your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, what um, she said really resonated with me. And I'm a big fan of this um, kind of phrase for youth, with youth, by youth. And also making sure that as entrepreneurs, as entrepreneurs, we're always thinking about um, user-centered design and design thinking. And that means having a team that's reflective of your audience. You know, um, within my nonprofit, it's all youth-led and youth-run. And I've always had this thought of if we're empowering youth, then, you know, my, my company needs to be run by youth because as much as I, I like to pretend I'm, I'm, I'm younger, you know, I, I'm, I'm not under the age of 25. I'm not under the age of 35. And so as much as I surround myself around young people, I'm still not, you know, living the same experiences that they're living. And I think, you know, sometimes it makes it hard for me to think like exactly how a young person might. And so I think this is why it's very important for, you know, us in power positions to really think about who is our audience that we're trying to reach, who is it that we're trying to impact, and making sure we're surrounding ourselves from people who are, you know, of that representative group, whatever that representative group is. Um, I'm running an event in next month that's all about, you know, building digital skills. Um, yeah. um, and one of the things that I did as part of this event, it's called IBM Z Day, in case anyone is interested in, uh, in registering. Um, but you know, what, what I did is I, I created in partnership with one of my colleagues, Misty, um, uh, a 24 hour code of on. And it's all about, you know, young people being able to come in and, you know, demystify computer science, demystify, you know, data science and recognize that any it's accessible to anyone. And what we did as part of these sessions is we chose youth ambassadors to be speakers and um, organizations that work with young people so that, you know, we would be reflective of our audience. So it's not just, you know, me and a bunch of IBMers, you know, planning uh, out an event, but really thinking about that concept of how do we put youth at the center? And if that's who we're trying to empower, then the young people should be on our team. And I'm a firm, you know, proponent of making sure that, you know, if there is a, you know, youth ambassador or a youth minister, that that person, you know, should be young and that should person should be able to think like a young person. Because whether you're 70, 60, 50 or 44 like me, you're, yeah. you're just, you weren't born, you know, 20 years ago. And so you can't think like a 20 year old or a 15 year old or a 25 year old. Okay. Jess, youth and entrepreneurship, it's something that don't mix much, but yet it's something that they are space so that then youth do not seek to only be employed. 
And one of the things that offers that opportunity is to be able to start your own uh, business or you start your own entrepreneurship, whether it's social entrepreneurship or business business. So how do we ensure that the youth come out with that mentality that they need not to entirely seek for jobs, but they can also be job creators? Um, yeah, I mean, really the biggest thing is just whenever I talk to a lot of kids about entrepreneurship, it just seems like there wasn't the tools there for them. And for a lot of them, they just kind of said, that's not within any realistic reality for me. I just can't do that. Um, or they would just ask questions, you know, I want to go to America so that I can do this, or I want to go to the UK so that I can, you know, become an entrepreneur and start my own company. Um, one of the things that has made, you know, Kenya so amazing to me is just the people and the culture. I come from a Hispanic background. My family is all Mexican immigrants to the U.S. And so we have a very rich culture in that. And that is something that I very much feed on right now in starting Idolina's leather, leather company. Um, I think the way that we can get a lot of Kenya youth to, uh, you know, see that they can start businesses, that they don't have to seek just employment, um, that they can create and that they can innovate is to show them that they don't have to follow an exact blueprint of what's been done for the past 60 years or so. As we've been talking about, the way that the youth think today, the tools that they have to work with are far different from any of the past business successes that we have seen before especially right now in a period of COVID being an issue, there is so many new problems that have been created that it would be a major setback to base all of our possibilities and all of our ideas solely on what has been done in the past even 10 years because the world has changed so rapidly within the past few months. And I think it would be great for Kenyan youth especially to see that, again, they don't have to look at those other places um, to, or the other worldly trends. I mean, they might look at, you know, fashion in Paris and think, wow, that's really cool. But I've, I've been to Paris and I saw amazing fashion there, but a lot of it didn't even measure up to what I saw while I was in Nairobi. And what they don't realize is there's such a unique culture there um, and they can stay true to that culture um, and make something that, you know, is made by youth and that they can be proud of. You know, we talked about how is agriculture cool well, there is so much, you know, great land for agriculture in Kenya right there. That's something that they can pursue, um, that it doesn't have to be like it is in other countries. Um, it can be something completely new. Here's a completely new era of innovation for them. And so I think just equipping them with the tools and showing them that this can be very uniquely you, um, that there's something new that you can work with. You don't have to be just like these other people. You are a new generation that is getting to create. Every journey is a story of challenges, but in the challenges, there is the hope. And in the hope, we find solutions. And so as we wind up this conversation, Najat, as you start by winding up the tent for us, what is our journey of hope and what are the solutions that we are looking at for the challenges that we do face in the entire perspective of where we are today? I think, as everyone has said, this period of COVID has been like a restart set for a lot of us, whereby the, so the status quo that has existed for a really long time has been flipped over, and now we're learning this new normal thing. And the beauty of this new normal is that there's a lot of opportunities, and from that, a lot of youth have been able to find their path and start new businesses and new entrepreneurship ventures that they would have never probably thought of starting. And it's also proved to us, I think, especially to me, that no state is permanent completely. One moment things are good, the next moment it's flipped over. So it's anyone's game, it's anyone's, um, as long as you take up the opportunity, it can be yours. Whatever you dream, whatever you aspire to do or to be, it's possible to achieve it. And I think the whole premise across this whole panel is that the youth are the ones who are meant to take charge. They're the ones who are meant to inform the policies and to make decisions and to step up to the plate and start 
making the changes they'd like to see in whatever capacity is possible. And I think the main thing I champion for is not to wait till you have a big platform or till you have a lot of resources or you have connections to be able to start on something. Whatever great idea you have, whatever little impact you'd like to make, just start on it. And along the way, people who believe in your idea or your journey or want to support will come and help you reach where you're meant to be. So I think that's the main takeaway and that's where the hope comes from because with COVID, we've all started afresh in a lot of areas. We're all relearning a lot of things. So it's not anyone's game. Nobody has the blueprint. Nobody knows what the next year is going to look like. And that's the beauty of it. And that's the saving grace, I think, in such, in such a period. So anybody can step up and do something. There's no blueprint. There's no path. Like previously, we've always had like a system where you have to go to high school and you go to university, you get your degree, then you get employment and then you eventually retire, you get your bonus and you settle. But now that everything is up in the air, even new careers are coming up, new opportunities are coming up and things that we thought to are set in stone are no longer part of the future that we're looking into. And with that, there's endless possibilities. And that's the beauty of it. That's the saving grace of, I think, the COVID. It's a restart button for me and for a lot of you. So, yeah. It, the reset button has been hit. And with that comes hope. Does there lie solution? Yeah, I mean, Nadja just said it so, so eloquently. I was just cheering her along the way as she said whatever she was saying. Because that I, I saw you fully smiling. Out. No, no, she's just, she's just taking me away, you know. It's, it's just so powerful coming from such a young person. Everything has been destabilized. Everything, I mean, we are starting afresh. We are like babies learning how to walk. We are learning how to eat new food. And so we must take up this. Everyone is like on the same pedestal at this moment. As I'm talking to you right now, I'm just reading about more than 207 pilots at Kenya with having been sent home. These are people who had gone to university and the only thing they knew to do was to be up in the air. And worldwide, I mean, many people aspire to be pilots. Right now, all of a sudden, we have been told because of COVID, this pilot has to look for something else to do. The young people who are pilots, we are welcoming them down here. If you've been downsized or whatever it is, just join the fight here. Let's get going. I mean, I, I trust and believe that things will be back up. We don't know how long. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's real hard. But we have to toughen it. I was through very hard moments. I mean, being locked up 23 and a half hours a day is not easy for a crime you've not committed. Being told that you're not going to see your kids, you're not going to see your friends, and the world being shut out on you. And then you just say, okay, fine, I know the sun will rise tomorrow. Whether I can see it or not, I saw the sun set for the first time after 18 years when I came home. And to me, some people take it as a normal thing, like you see the sun setting every day. To me, seeing the sunset brought tears to my eyes after 18 years. So things can be tough. Things can be had, but I can tell you they're not insurmountable. We'll make it through this post-COVID period. Peter, journey of resilience is matched by none, and it's something that gives hope. And on the basis of hope, then, Melissa, that solution that we do have, how do we pursue it as you wind up your speech? You know, um, before I get there, I... Um... I just want to. I just wanted to tell all of you that um, you've left me inspired, um, and this is why I I do talks like this um, is partly to inspire myself and remind me why I do the work that I do, but also remember the kind of company that I'm in around the world. Like I'm absolutely not worthy to be sitting on a panel with um, the experiences um, that some of you have went through in your lives, and we all have our journeys and our tragedies. And it sounds like all of us have used. Um, you know, our tragedies or our opportunities um, to create our superpowers. And I think that's um, the big thing that I want to leave folks with is what is your superpower? You know, what is it that um, wakes you up in the morning um, that keeps you doing whatever it is that you do? You know, I, I hear about empowering youth, uh, empowering uh, women and girls, um, empowering people who were formerly incarcerated, um, you know, I, I, I leave this thinking that we're all doing great work and um, how can we empower youth to know that you can be an entrepreneur, 
you can be an entrepreneur and you can change the world. And you may not start out thinking about, you know, changing the world, but by changing something in your life or your family's life or your community's life, you are in turn changing the world. Jess. Yes. By even changing your life, you are changing the world. From your end, what advice do you give as one of the solutions that we must pursue? Um, really, just what advice I would give is, you know, over, if you look at all of human history, um, we've had some of these, maybe this isn't so much an existential crisis, but there's been crises throughout um, human history. And it's at those moments of crisis where you've seen nations come together, um, where you've seen people come together to solve a really big problem. And I think that when we say things have changed right now, I, I think it's really exciting. I mean, it might sound, you know, kind of backwards, but I think it's a hope um, that we have that there is no option to sit around and continue doing what we have been doing. And um, we do not have the convenience of previous generations, maybe uh, long ago to, um, you know, think about entrepreneurship as, you know, a company's sole purpose is to make money or to make profit. We don't have the luxury of getting to do that anymore. There is a huge shift um, in our world today. And so I think that's a really, you know, big hope is I'm making, you know, I'm making leather wallets. It's not, <laughs> that, has, that has been done for a very long time. Um, but it's a small shift towards bringing e-commerce and a handcraft to Kenya um, and showing youth that they, they can do that. Um, I think that's really kind of, it's the small shifts that really are hope because we don't have, again, we don't have the convenience of getting to sit around and say, we're not going to innovate. We're not going to try new things. And as, um, as much as that lack of convenience might sound like a curse, I think that really is a hope because it's an inevitable call to action that can't go unanswered, especially for young kids these days. Jess, I must say that I'm still looking forward to the moment when your leather comes from the Kenyan market as one of the places where you get your raw material. But as we get to the final panelist, Sankara, how has it been a journey of hope and a journey of solutions? But even as we look to those solutions, then there are things that we must put in place. So how do we get there and ensure that we are on the right path without giving up, without saying that the challenges came too fast and too furious and we abandoned it along the way. Yeah, I think one of, um, so first things first, everything Najat said, like everything she said is my first point. <laughs> then my second point is going to, I cannot emphasize enough on the need for education you have to educate yourself as young people we need to do that we need to do research if it's in fields that we are scared to dare to venture into just as jess said because a majority of the time whatever you know a breakthrough is always over there but you have to cross to get to where it is and some of the things that can allow for you to be able to do that is if you're constantly and consistently investing in yourself, in your knowledge, in your skills. What is it that I know? If it's in the informal sector, what is it that I need to do? If it's in the formal sector, white collar, blue collar, what is it that I'm supposed to know? What is it that I'm supposed to be doing? That is the one thing that I'm going to talk about, you know, to just keep emphasizing on education. The other thing is, um, you know, it is, has, has some dimensions of anthropology. I think it's very important for us to know who we are. Who are we? Where are we coming from? And for us to understand where it is that we are going, you have to understand where you're coming from. And young people, we like shortcuts. We like things that happen quickly, you know? We like to make a quick dime. So if an idea is so big and we feel like it's so tedious, we like to first think, perhaps I find some, a couple of side hustles and then come back and work on this main one. Resilience. We have been asked to be resilient. We have been asked to persevere. A majority of the inventions that we are able to enjoy today, for example, whether it's like the light that we have, artificial light, it came from a simple bulb. You can imagine how many times I think it was Thomas Edison went over and over and over trying to do that. 
So that's another thing. Resilience is going to be very important. The other thing is what we, you know, this session has, is, is advocating for through Dr. Washiri and Dr. Elizabeth, that is yeah. integrity. You have to employ integrity in everything that you're doing because things that take a long time are very tempting for us to either fall off or fall in. If we are falling into the ways that we have seen, the ways that we are becoming socialized to us is corruption. Do you want to be corrupt? Is that how we are going to make sure that we are able to preserve our nations, to preserve our societies, to preserve our people? The question of integrity is going to be very important. Lastly, it's going to be excellence. Ensuring that we are excellent in everything that we do. Ensuring that we are excellent in how we establish networks, how we establish networks, how we cash in on our networks. It's going to be very, very crucial for young people today to want to be counted for them to stand up, but they have to do that in an excellent way. We've seen young people being used by whether it's politicians, whether it's by businessmen, just for the destruction of their tomorrow, destruction of spaces that the youth are going to rise and sit in tomorrow. So we have to really be sure that we really understand what it is that we stand for and what we represent, because we are a heritage right now for Africa, for Kenya. Tomorrow, there's going to be other people as soon as we transition past 35, we are told we are no longer young people, right? And we become ostracized in the other category of older people because they think we are too young. So then the question is, where are we supposed to be? Wherever it is you are right now is the right place for you to start. Wherever it is you are right now, it's never too late. It's never too late. You can cash in right now and it's a win-win. So I think ultimately also is to also thank everybody that's been on this panel and to say, okay. let us make sure that our influence is continuously going beyond our spheres of influence. And I really, I'm really, really, really proud of Najad. I'm so impressed. You know, like if, imagine that is the power that those are the voices we have of young people and nobody's listening to them. I, I, I need to stop saying us because my age group has transitioned out. So. But anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank so let's strive. let's strive. It couldn't have been close to any more powerful than Sankara has done it. And I suspected she would do that and inspire uh, the youth. So while also recapping the things that have been powerfully said by the other presenters. So then we come to the journey. And uh, she said that as we take that anthropological journey, we need to examine ourselves and say, who are we? And how do we ensure that that change is what we yearn for and take for it? Melissa, we see a little one who is also an upcoming leader. And we say hi yep, to him. This is Gagey. Hello. Say hi, Gagey. He said hi, Gagey. Hello, Katie. <laughs> He's a future cloud solution architect. Oh, yeah, impressive, good. impressive. You say that is the way to go. So thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jess. Uh, thank you, Najat. And uh, thank you, Melissa, as well as Sankara. Pete, thank you so much for the wonderful job that you're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a, an awesome journey, and it's been powerful conversation that is going to impact many people for ages and ages. But even beyond that, you have beautiful stories that you must keep telling. Because sharing in as much as it's caring, it is also the way to care for the world enough to share yourself so that then your journey and your story gets to be that change. Thank you so much, David.